Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. Annie Laurie and I are co presidents of the Freedom from Religion Foundation, which works to keep state and church separate and to educate the public about the views of atheists and agnostics. But Dan, my co host, has not always been an atheist. He used to be a Christian minister. And so we're going to turn the tables today, and instead of your interviewing somebody, Dan, I'm going to interview you so, about your journey out of faith. So don't embarrass me too much on today's show. Well, we'll see. It's quite a journey. And uh, how, how, did, how were you raised? Well, my mom and dad were musicians. They were raised in nominal Christian faith, but they met in a dance band. Uh, in fact, my dad was involved in the California music industry, and he was actually uh, on that 1948 musical Easter Parade by Irving Berlin. I want to go back, I want to go back, I want to go back to that old farm. Far away from home, with the milk pail on my arm. And of course that was with Irving Berlin, that was uh, Judy Garland with yeah. your dad in the cameo. And that was a secular music production, but what happened then? And he also met uh, Fred Astaire, who was in that m movie as well. But then mom and dad started having babies. I was the first. And then they got very conservative. They threw away all of their dance records. They, they disavowed all of that worldly music and became very devout conservative Christians and were churchgoers. And they took us kids to church all the time since I can remember. Here's, here's a picture of us three boys with little bow ties getting ready for church. Uh, that's really uh, fun. And, and I actually liked it. I thought, wow, I'm living in the, in the best family. It was a fun family. I was in the right country, in the right religion. I was in the right time of history. And I thought, this is wonderful. I get to be a part of God's family. Now, your family remained musical, so they, they sort of had a de facto musical ministry. Your mother was a singer. My mom was a wonderful singer. And of course, Dad played his trombone. And I was learning to play piano when I was in early high school and that. And so we formed a little family musical team where we went around from church to church. And we, we did ministry, and we preached, and we sang. and. I thought it was a really special family to be a part of, part of God's kingdom and God's calling at the end of the world. So your parents became fundamentalist, is that right? They were fundamentalists, yes. Dad they, was, you said that they church hopped. They did. My parents uh, were so extremely evangelical fundamentalist Christians that they had trouble finding a church that was conservative enough mm -hmm. for them. So we tried this, we tried that. We were in the Nazarene church for a while. We were Baptist church for a while. And eventually we settled into a, a non-denominational uh, charismatic church, you know, which, which was the Holy Spirit and the feelings of, of God's presence and speaking in tongues and faith healing and all of that. So we were pretty much, we were pretty wild. And didn't you also do uh work for a faith healer? I did, yeah. Well, Catherine Kuhlman used to come to Los Angeles uh, once a month. She was out of Pennsylvania. And uh, as she was at the Shrine Auditorium. And I was actually the librarian for Catherine Kuhlman's choir. And I sat up there just a few feet from Catherine Kuhlman as she was doing the faith healings in her long kind of Grecian robes and the power of God. And I thought, wow, this is special. Who could possibly deny the truth and the reality and the power of the Holy Spirit of God after seeing all of these things, seeing miracles and seeing all. So you also, I understood, you've told me you took your Bible to school. You were an early evangelist and became a teenage evangelist. When I was 15, I accepted what I was convinced was a call to the ministry. I was sitting in church and the Bible says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And I thought the world was going to end any minute. I didn't think I was going to live long enough to go to college or get married or have kids. Or I thought, wow, it could be any time. So what's more important than bringing people into the kingdom? And I did. I carried my Bible to school. And I was one of those. I was that guy on campus. You know, I would come up to you with confidence and talk to you about Jesus. Uh, in fact, Richard Dawkins in the uh, foreword to my book, Godless, he wrote, Dan wasn't just a preacher. He was the kind of preacher you would not want to sit next to on a bus. <laughs> and you've told me that when I met you, and it was hard to believe because, of course, you were an atheist by then. But so you were really full of the Spirit 
and you went to Mexico, correct? Well, yeah, I was a, you know, Southern California was close to Mexico. So we got to go down to the dark mission field and con convert people to Jesus. And I spent about a total of two years in Mexico trying to convert Catholics into Christians, if you can believe that. Because we Protestants thought Catholics had the wrong Christian faith. They needed the message. Although I learned really quickly in Mexico that you can't get anywhere if you don't say something about Mary. Say something about the Virgin Mary. So in all my sermons, I would mention Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was the Lamb of God. And uh, we, we had a lot of converts, and uh, I spent a lot of time in those little villages down there. Uh, preaching. And speaking in Spanish. All in Spanish, kind yeah. Of fluent. And that's where I learned Spanish, was living there in Mexico and Southern California. About half of my friends were Spanish speakers, and we were in a lot of those Christian churches in Santa Ana, in Anaheim, in Orange County, all, all through Southern California. So then uh, you did go to a religious college. I did. Uh, the world didn't end yet, so I actually... <laughs> well, I would think that would have been very stressful for you to think that. It wasn't stressful. It was like, wow, I get to be on the front line of this, and the world's going to end, and Jesus is coming, and I get to go to heaven and be told that I was a good and faithful servant. It was crazy. I admit it was totally crazy, but it wasn't stressful. <laughs> it was like... Uh, you know, I was that guy that was so confident. I would think that you would look at me and you would want what I had, this, this sense of peace and purpose and joy and love of, of Jesus. And I, I, became a, I became born again myself, and I decided you needed to be born again. And so I went to college. I, went to I was born right the first time. <laughs> I know you were. Huh? You didn't need to be unborn or born again. So which college did you go to? I went to Azusa Pacific College. It's now Azusa Pacific University. I went the four years. I eventually got a degree in religion, and it was a good school. It was mostly, it was almost like a glorified Sunday school at that time. It was good, but we learned how to interpret the Bible. What is the book of Romans? What is Hebrew poetic literature? And, and you know, how to build a sermon and how to preach and all of those things. And, and meanwhile, you were, uh, of course, uh, we haven't talked about your music. You were learning the piano. You were almost self-taught. Um, wasn't that a big part of your ministry? That was. Piano was a big part of it. And here's this on-fire young person who does music. So I was called on a lot. I spent almost every night of every week at some church somewhere playing the piano, writing music, directing choirs. I was on some local TV shows, and we traveled around, mostly at that time in Southern California. But eventually we did some cross-country tours as well, not you, just you Mexico. You were working with a group of young people? A number of, of groups. Course. The Frank Gonzalez Evangelistic Association, a group called Youth Unlimited Gospel Outreach. Y-U-G-O spells yugo, which means yoke in Spanish. And, uh, and so we, we, we went all the way to, to both coasts, and we were pre preaching in churches and in prisons and uh, on park benches. And, but you were uh, also writing Christian music. I was writing Christian music. And, and then you became ordained? I became ordained uh, the Standard Community Christian Church in uh, Standard, California, ordained me to become, uh, you know, an, an official minister. They, I didn't think I needed to be ordained. I thought that once you um, are called by God, that's all you need. But they said it would be good to have an ordination so that I could perform weddings and, and do that. So I did become ordained and then became more of an evangelist. I was a co-pastor in three different California churches, uh, youth, music, and then basic preaching and pastoring. But then I became uh, more of an independent um, Christian evangelist. So living on what you call love offerings, which is when you would, you would just perform in churches and then t they would take up an offering for you, Yeah, that kind of thing. That's called living by faith. So when did you start? Uh, you started composing music and you had records, you had all kinds of other assignments, right? Well, then uh, on one of our cross-country tours, there was a week of meetings that fell through. So I spent that week and I wrote a Christian musical called Mary Had a Little Lamb, which was picked up by Manna Music in California. And it became for a while their best seller. Now, can you explain what that so, title is? Well, I think our viewers are sophisticated enough to know the theology that Mary, the mother of Jesus, Jesus is the Lamb of God, so... Mary, Mary had, had a, little, a lamb. little lamb. And then you followed that up with... Then I followed... It was such a success that they wanted a follow-up. Mary Had a Little Lamb's The Christmas Story, 
And so I followed it up with the Easter story called His Fleece Was White as Snow because supposedly the final Passover sacrifice had to be an unblemished animal and Jesus was without sin and so he became the final sacrifice. And it's embarrassing. I actually killed off Snowy, the little lead character in that, because that's what the Bible says. So children are were performing this in churches, and some of them still are. Yeah, and there's there's uh, churches that put it on like a puppet show, and sometimes they dress up like, like they dress up like as full animals, and they perform it. Even adults put it on, but it was basically aimed as a children's musical from the point of view of the animals telling the gospel story, first Christmas and then Easter. So we're getting the idea. You were really a true believer. I mean, sometimes this comes up in debates that you do now as an atheist. Oh, you must not really have believed. You really did believe. I did. You even performed for Pat Boone, for example. You yeah. were immersed in, in the Christian religion. You have what you called a Christian marriage. Well, then what happened? Well, then uh, sometime around the age of 30, I was really into it and I wanted to learn more. I realized the world wasn't ending yet. Then I was having children. I did go to college and then, you know, I was wondering. And I remember I was singing and playing the piano in a church that had performed one of my musicals. And they had a big sign up above the stage that said, Jesus is coming soon. And you can see this big painted sign. But I noticed there were cobwebs and the paint was peeling off the back of the sign. Jesus is coming soon, but he hadn't come yet. and I think I was maturing, and so I didn't, I didn't just wake up one day and go, oh, ha, ha, silly me, there's no God, I'm an atheist, ha, ha. It didn't happen like that way. There was, I think it happens in most lives of Christians, and I think it happens with most ministers, that you moderate your views a little bit through your life. Now, so I, I started moving. I think that we need to take a little break, so when we come back, Dan, we need to find out how you did lose faith in faith and what happened and all the repercussions, quite a dramatic change in your life. We'll be right back with Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. I'm Liz, and I am an atheist. I was raised as a Catholic, but my family was not terribly active in church, and my mom really pushed me to achieve in school. So as a result, I got a great education, and I've always been a critical thinker, an avid reader, and a skeptic. I gradually questioned religion until I finally realized that whether I want to or not, I can't force my mind to believe in any gods. When I look at my two sweet little kids, I feel strongly that the only things that matter in life are how we live in the present and how we leave the world for our kids. Life is short and you have to be true to yourself. I enjoy and savor life. I love my family. I am a good person and I am an out of the closet atheist. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, and I'm turning the tables on my co-host, Dan Barker, and in interviewing you about this really wild ride that you had from very fervent evangelical minister, preacher, to atheist, to the point where you are now co-president of the Freedom from Religion Foundation. So we were just getting to the point, Dan, you've given all your Christian credentials where suddenly there was a light turning on. What happened? Well, it was a gradual process. It didn't happen overnight, like I said, but it was a maturing within Christianity. Most of the evidence against Christianity is within Christianity. It's Christian scholars. So I was a fundamentalist for a while, but I started to read more and I started to soften. And my sermon started having less hell and more love, if you know what I mean. I started thinking less about the afterlife and the second coming and more about how do we live this life. And I thought, oh, I'm maturing. I'm becoming more sophisticated as a minister. I'm now able to see more of the gray areas. And so I became more of a moderate Christian for a while. 
And after a couple more years, I became also more of a liberal Christian where I was wondering, well, maybe this whole God concept is just like, you know, there's the, the, product, the parable of the prodigal son Jesus told isn't a true story. It was a parable to illustrate a truth. And the Jews made this metaphor parable about Adam and Eve, which they didn't mean it to be a true story. And I realized there are Christians, and I was meeting a lot of these pastors in my evangelism. They didn't think Adam and Eve was a literal story. They thought it was a metaphor. And then I thought, well, what other character in the Bible? Maybe Yahweh, maybe God himself is just one big parable that the Israelites made up to explain the world. It doesn't actually have to be true to be meaningful. And so that sounds more like liberal talk. And so I went through this four or five year periods of migrating across that spectrum to where I finally got to like Paul Tillich and other theologians who I think were kind of basically atheistic, but they were using God in this sort of more amorphous sense of uh, the ground of all being, more philosophical. And eventually, after all of that, in 1983, in the summer of 83, I realized, you know what? It's all just one big figure of speech. But I was still preaching. I was still going through the motions. And I well, thought, your whole life was, was, was religion, right? Yeah, the it whole was, thing was it religion. It was your income. It was your, your family, your social life, your raison d'etre. Yeah, and my calendar had future speaking, preaching events on it. So I was still trying to fit this changing theology into uh, this old, you know, this old wineskin of the way I used to be. And I would get, I remember preaching sometimes thinking, you know, I don't know if I believe this anymore. I stood in the pulpit and I was saying these things and the audience was clapping and saying amen and praise God. And uh, I remember in the summer of 1983, I realized it's, you know, it's just me. It's just a natural world. This is just a human invention. But I was still preaching, and one woman came up to me after a sermon, and she said, Reverend Barker, I want you to know, I really felt the Spirit of God on your ministry. And I'm thinking, you did? Because I was no longer feeling that anymore, but I was trapped in this. Uh, well, it must have been a terrible feeling. It was, and it lasted until December of that year. And, and actually, we found some footage of the very last day that I did Christian ministry, that evening, I performed my last concert at a church in Auburn, California. But that afternoon, I played a piano concert with a friend of mine, playing some of those good old gospel hymns. did something very dramatic. Well, after that day, I realized I can't be a phony anymore. Uh, I need to have integrity. I can't stand up and say one thing while I'm thinking another. So I stopped. And I sent out a letter to everyone I could think of. I sent out a letter to all my friends, Christian co-workers, co-ministers, Christian publishers. I was right in the middle of writing another Christian musical for Gospel Light Publications. And I sent out a one-page letter saying, uh, I'm not a believer anymore. Don't invite me to preach anymore. Well, you could invite me to preach if you want, but it'll be a totally different sermon. So what reaction did you get? Well, the reactions were all across the board. I got, surprisingly, some very kind and loving reaction from Christian people, and we're still friends today, who understood that people go through a transition. But I also got, if you can imagine it, I got all of them. I also got some ugly, hateful, horrible reactions from people that I thought were my friends, turns out they, they could not stand me changing my views. And I, I got to tell you, that's a good way to test your friendships, <laughs> is tell them that you've totally changed your views. And your mother came from Arizona on a bus, right? To, she was all concerned. And, yeah. and then you found out shortly after that that she had stopped believing after talking with you about this, she, and then gradually your father stopped believing. Yeah. So that was quite a... My, my mother told a reporter, she used to be a Sunday school teacher, and after we talked, and I pointed out to her, these are things that you would never tell your children in Sunday school. I mean, the kind of God that's in this Bible, and mom said, you're right. And she told a reporter that, you know what? It's so nice being an atheist now, I don't have to hate anymore. <laughs> And Richard Dawkins quoted that. Yeah, in his um, preference. Well, when you think about the treatment of gays, for example, yeah. by, by fundamentalists, what a relief for her 
a loving person <clears throat> who felt her religion was making her uh, treat people badly. Yeah, why teach kids <clears throat> about genocide and infanticide and these horrible things in the Bible? So after you left religion and, of course, struggling to um, support yourself and your family, going into computers, right, uh, you happened to write me a letter. I wrote you a letter. I had read that book that you wrote, Woe to the Women, which I thought was very good from a woman's point of view about the Bible's treatment of women. Well, to the woman, the Bible tells me so. And then you guys invited me to write an article for Free Thought Today. And then I got a call from a producer of a show in Chicago called AM Chicago. And it was uh, September of 1984 where I met you for the first time and your mother, Anne. In Nicole Chicago. Bell, in Chicago. Uh, and the host of that show was Oprah Winfrey. Joining me now is a former ordained minister of 17 years who gave up his religion, Dan Barker. So, tell me your story, Dan. I was one of the those ex guys. The ex-reverend. Right. The ex-reverend. The ex-reverend. Yes. I was one of those guys that would walk up to you on the street and tell you about Jesus Christ and would convince you to say the sinner's prayer, would convince you that you were a sinner deserving of damnation, tell you about Jesus' love, read the Bible to you, and pray with, with people like yourself, with many people. I was an evangelist, and I loved the gospel, the, the calling of the ministry, and I've changed my mind. What made you change your mind, Dan? I, I could give a little bit of levity. In 30 years of going to church and being a preacher, I never got to sleep in on Sunday mornings. Is that the, the one chance? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dan, for goodness sake, sleep in on Saturday. The Bible is an unreliable document, and it is a very uninspiring document, and my heart cannot accept what my mind rejects after serious study. And so you have decided what? There is no God? Well, I am an atheist now, yes. I, I do not p personally hold a belief in God. Which, which is the definition You went from of 17 years of being a minister to not believing in God. That's right. That what does that say about you? That means, I was, that means I was wrong. I made a mistake. So, Dan, uh, after the Oprah Winfrey show, I mean, that must have been de-baptism by fire. That right? was the very first time I had ever publicly spoken about my new atheism before any group, much less on television. So that was quite an experience. And also, you said it was the first time you had openly met atheists. That's right. You know, I'd met atheists before, but... We the were the first, first atheist you'd really, open atheist you'd really met. You know, I met a man who, who I knew was an atheist, but you were the first I'd ever actually met and talked with, and it was on that show that day. Yeah, so. I mean, and you were just out of the ministry, so we were looking at you kind of like, is he really for yeah. real? And you were looking at us. But, uh, and then we uh, invited you to speak at the Freedom from Religion Foundation convention in Milwaukee. Just a few weeks later, that's right. Uh, yes, and, and, then your, and then your free thought career really took off. I think we have a little bit of me talking. My very first free thought speech is called Standing on the Premises. The last time that I stood up in front of a group of people to speak like this was 10 months ago in a church. So this is new, I mean, this is brand new you know, different for me. January was my coming out of the closet. And, uh, after so many years of being a preacher and standing in front of people, I find myself with this almost irresistible urge to take up an offering tonight, you know? I can't. <laughs> You're gonna have to bear with me a little bit. That was fun, that was, to, to get to meet other free thinkers in the world and realize that not everybody's a Christian. And of course, we have to summarize this, the rest is history. Uh, you did become a very active part of the Freedom from Religion Foundation uh, since 84, have been our public relations director, and since 2004... Since 87. 87, and yeah. since 2004, co-president co with me. Co-president with you. And you have done how many debates? I've done more than 130 public, formal, moderated debates on questions of atheism and state church. And you've written, I'm not, I've lost track, how many books? We'll start... About we'll 10 books put, now. Put them up on the screen. And the first book you wrote for us was um, a children's book, Just Pretend Losing, or Just Pretend a Free Thought Book for Children, mm -hmm. which is just coming out in the new illustrated version. And then you wrote Losing Faith in Faith from Preacher to Atheist. That's right, 1992. And then you've been uh, solicited to write books uh, by a lot of major publishers, including um, what, uh, Godless? Godless, that's God, right. And God the... Uh, God, the most unpleasant character in all fiction, which Richard Dawkins asked me to write. Books on, uh, books on good... on. Free will, yeah. The good atheist, 
Um, That's right. And uh, and then the new one called Mere Morality, which is doing kind of what C.S. Lewis did with Christianity, Mere Christianity, stripping morality down to the basics. So, in summary, um, why did you become an atheist, and and why should others lose their faith? Well, because Christianity and theism don't make sense. They appeal to fear and to emotion. And I realized painfully that I was wrong. Like I told Oprah on that show, I was wrong. There's no evidence for a God, no good evidence for a God. There's no good argument for a God. And there's about a dozen arguments, you know, design and first cause and ontological, but they're all bad. Bertrand Russell even said, they just boil down to bad grammar when you look at them. There's uh, no agreement among believers about the nature of this God or its moral principles. There is um, no coherent definition of a God. No one can even define what a God or what a spirit even is. There's no good reply to the problem of evil. The so-called holy books like the Bible and the Quran are really just bad moral guides. They are not reliable. They are contradictory. The Bible especially is very contradictory. And so as an atheist, uh, secular humanist, where do your morals and your ethics come from? Well, uh, besides no evidence and no argument, there's no need for a God because you can be a good, happy, moral, productive, meaningful person without believing in a God. And, and most of us non-believers say that holy books are horrible for morality. All you need to do is look at harm. Like your mother used to say, is it reasonable and is it kind? And if you're living a life with the intention of minimizing real harm in the real world, not trying to flatter the ego of some supernatural dictator, then that's what morality means. Well, you have done a lot of reverse <coughs> penance in the last, uh, what, 30 years? Is this show 40, one of them? 40 years. <laughs> Well, and working for separation of church and state today. So uh, talk about a positive um, meaning in life. Yes, because meaning in life comes from trying to solve problems. And there are plenty of problems, including state church problems, that need to be solved. And that gives us an immense purpose in our lives. Well, Dan, uh, you, you're known as the friendly neighborhood atheist. You have quite a story. People can learn more about it um, by reading your books. Um, it was kind of fun to turn the tables today. Uh, and interview you about your story. I'll do that to you someday. Someday. <laughs> well, thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters.